Good afternoon. Welcome to UAB's Town Hall for Employees. Um, I'm Rosie O'Byrne. I'm with University Relations. Uh, today we're going to hear some area updates from leadership. Um, after that, we will uh, turn to pre-submitted questions that have been um, turned in, submitted, and um, our leadership will answer those first, and then we'll turn it, uh, turn it over to live Q&A. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes. This is being recorded and will be available on UAB's YouTube channel later. Um, check back either later today or tomorrow. And we're also, if there are any questions that are not answered, um, our communications team is working on answering those and we'll follow up in the next, um, or next couple of e-reporters. So just keep your eye out for uh, follow-up questions in the e-reporter. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Watts. Thank you, Rosie. Well, welcome everyone. This town hall is to keep you as informed as possible so that you are an important part of our return to campus, those who have not yet returned. Before we get started today, I wanna to acknowledge a young man and some distressing news for the UAB family. Alan Merrick is a freshman on the UAB football team who was visiting home in Gaston yesterday and he suffered a gunshot wound. I'm not in a position to comment on Alan's condition but it's obviously a very hard time for his family and for our football players and coaches. I ask that all of us respect their privacy, but at the same time, I ask you to join me to keep them all in our thoughts and prayers. Well, today's town hall is to talk about our plan for uh, start of the fall semester. Classes begin on August 24th. We have brought back our entire clinical enterprise, which is extremely busy every day. We brought back most of our research enterprise and we've been working and planning very diligently with our medical experts, our public health experts, our informatics and information technology experts, our educational experts, and we've put together the most comprehensive plan or return to campus in the nation. We have developed a lot of tools, some digital tools to help us monitor the health and safety of our employees and our students on a daily basis. And as you probably know, we are testing all of our students before they come back to campus to make sure that they are COVID free and that we can keep them safe together. We have a very comprehensive sentinel testing program where we sample a random sample of employees and students each week and test them for COVID positivity. It gives us a sense of is this virus moving within our population or not. And the good thing is all of our testing to date has shown that it's less than 1% of anyone who's been randomly tested or among the students who have been tested to come back so far. Safety and health of our employees and students in our community and the patients and families we care for has always been our top priority. But at the same time, fulfilling our most important mission is also vital to the people of Alabama. So we have tried to plan and use our expertise collectively. I wanna thank everyone who's worked so hard on these plans. People have worked above and beyond the call of duty and worked well together and nobody worrying about who's working harder than the other, but everybody pulling together. And it really has made me and all of us proud of UAB and of our greatest asset, you, our people. Data will drive our decisions and we have among the best monitoring programs in the world. So we will always keep you informed and that's the purpose of today's town hall. You'll hear from some of us who will speak for a few moments and address some of the questions that you've already submitted about important topics. And then we'll have an open question and answer period for half an hour or so where we can address any questions that you have. We want you to be as informed as possible and we want you to understand your important role in this whole process. Each and every one counts every day. And we need you to do your part We've got all these great plans and all this science and 
medicine and public health behind us, but human behavior is going to be critical to our success. That's why we're going to have a zero tolerance for non-compliance with our safety measures. Wearing a mask at all times, physical distancing, good hygiene, and not gathering in groups. So you'll hear a lot more about some of these specifics, but we need each one of us to understand it's our responsibility to take care and protect all of those around us. And if we do that, we can stop this virus. We know that these measures will stop the spread. And it's low in our population. We want to keep it that way. We want to keep everybody safe as we come back. You'll hear more about the different mechanisms for teaching. Innovation is throughout technology. We've spent millions of dollars on technology to make sure that we can meet all the parts of our mission. So with that, I will stop and I'd like to turn it over to our Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Pam Benoit. Pam? Pam, you're muted. Pam, you're muted. There we go. Um, there are several things I'd like to say this morning, this afternoon, I guess, now this afternoon. Um, one is, um, thank you so much for tuning in today. It's important to have information, to know what's going on so that you can feel comfortable in a return to campus. Um, from the academic side, we're now 10 days away from most of our students coming back for the beginning of the fall semester. And so I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about what that will look like for students. Some of you may not only be employees, but may also be students as well. So here are some things that you would need to know. First, we are offering courses in a variety of delivery formats. Some classes will be in person. Some classes will be what we've labeled hybrid, which is a combination of in-person and remote learning. Some classes will be remote only, and some classes will be online. And here's a nice little chart that shows the difference between each one of those. We've also outfitted the classrooms with cameras that track with the instructor so that if you are in a hybrid class, for example, the day that you are remote, you'll be able to see what's going on and participate actively in that classroom. The other thing we've done is that we've measured all of the classrooms and I want to do a big shout out to Greg Parsons and the facilities team here. They helped us figure out how many students could be accommodated in every one of the classrooms we're teaching classes on in the fall. And we have taken chairs out or wrapped chairs and desks so that people will maintain their social distancing. Another piece of this is mask wearing. So masks will be required for all students in an in-person uh, setting, either in-person or hybrid, so that there's an expectation that you will be wearing your mask at all times uh, when you're in the classroom. And then I would also say the last piece of this is the health check. So we're asking students to do a daily health check. And as part of that, you can get a passport that shows that you are cleared for the day so that we can assess whether or not you can be in class for that particular day. So there are a variety of different health and safety measures that have been put in place to ensure that the classrooms will be safe for both instructors as well as for students. Uh, the classroom schedules are up now. And it's possible to look on each one of the classes that a student has elected to see what delivery format that class will be offered in. The other thing I wanted to mention was masks. So we have said that masks will be required. They're required for faculty, staff, and students. And we are distributing those to students, particularly since this is an employee town hall, I wanna to talk a little bit about the mask distribution for, for staff. Staff and employees are going to be receiving two masks, teaching faculty will receive two masks and two face shields. Teaching faculty will have their masks and shields distributed through their dean's offices. Uh, staff and employees will receive the two masks. The masks are avail available on Friday the 21st and Saturday the 22nd from nine to noon in Express Lot 4 or in the first week of class at Lister Hill University Hall and the UAB bookstore. And after that point, they'll be available in the bookstore. You need your one card in order to claim your mask. Uh, you can only pick up the mask for you. I will say these masks are UAB branded. We do know that when our uh, company who did the mask uh, did them, some of them didn't quite get the branding that we wanted. And so if you get one of those, you'll get a coupon so that you can turn that in later for a UAB mask. 
And again, you're not required to wear this mask. We happen to think this mask is pretty cool, but if you wanna wear a different mask, that's fine too. We just wanna make sure that you have access to the mask. So there, there are lots and lots of plans in place to make sure that we have a very smooth transition into the fall semester and a safe one. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Vickers. Thank you, Ray and Pam. And I too am excited to see the engagement of our employees and, and staff just to be updated and hear about our plans and strategy. I'll, I'll talk about a, a couple things. One, uh, Dr. Watts mentioned that our clinical enterprise has been back in full force. Um, it, it had a period where we were in decreased density in the hospital, where we were looking for a surge in April and May, and then gradually ramped back up uh, to taking care of patients and doing our elective volume. And as most of you are aware, we've also then had to do that in the face of some increased numbers within our state, particularly around Memorial Day and uh, July the 4th. And we're just now looks like we're getting to the end of that July the 4th rise, as well as benefiting from a statewide mask order. I think you can observe across the country where those states that don't use that mask order or have been late or been incomplete in its compliance, it still wreaks a havoc on the community when that doesn't happen. So we do think seeing the, the, the number of cases go down gradually over the last few days um, is a sign that the mask order is working and that number one, we're getting farther away from that July um, uh, intervening event where people were out a lot and engaged. Along with that, uh, we have, with the President Watts direction and our UA system and our Chancellor's direction, we've tried to put forward a plan that is extremely comprehensive. And I'll share along with some of the details that Dr. Watts mentioned. And the plan did use our best talent, Dr. Paul Irwin, uh, who's the Dean of School of Public Health, co-chaired a, a task force with me as well as with Katie Osborne um, to help put forward a, a strategy around re-entry and creating the safety that Dr. Watts spoke about. Many people, including Gina Marazzo, who's head of our ID group, Mike Sag, Mike Fairclough, who are lead our efforts around students and ID, as well as Sarah Nafsinger, who's on here, We've used the expertise of our School of Public Health, even beyond Paul, Suzanne Judd has done a phenomenal job and multiple people from the School of Medicine, Dr. Agarwal and Tony Leaf in particular. But as it relates to the plan, it is a five part plan as I would like to call it. It very much begin with education and, and communication. And part of that plan is what you're hearing today. It's the communication with you and we're not taking anything for granted. Dr. Watts said, we are gonna be driven by data and we'll share that as things evolve. Secondly, it does very much around uh, PPE use and the, the, the behaviors that will allow for successful uh, continuation of our plan, but also limit transmission of virus. And that very much remains around wearing a mask and distancing and having those facilities honor those distancing when that occurs. And, and that's a critical part that we can't underestimate. We've then had the unique opportunity for our campus first, our system next, and all the colleges in the state add the ability to have a regular COVID screen. And that COVID screen led by the work of our faculty, Sue Feldman and Mohan Theramulai and Sarah Parkak, who've helped develop this, particularly Suzanne, and Suzanne I should say Sue and Mohan, it provides really an AI driven online tool for which we, we too hope to go to daily uh, COVID screen for your symptoms, which will really heighten our ability for individuals who have symptoms to either stay home as uh, uh, Pam spoke about, if your passport is red, you don't need to come in. And then secondly, to direct you to student or employee health based on those symptoms. And, and that's pretty powerful. N not all colleges will have that. In some degree, some would say many would not have that. If they do, it's often on paper. So we're, we're appreciative of that addition, but we didn't stop there. We then, uh, with the leadership of Sue and Kurt Carver, have really led the country and really the few leaders in the world to develop 
a technology driven uh, contact notification app that really has the ability to look at your exposures if you have a positive test with a 14 day window. Uh, and in addition to do that, uh, verify that your test was legitimate through the school of pub through the state department of public health and then send that uh, information to anybody who's been in contact with you if you had a positive ex positive test within that 14 days if they were in contact closer than six feet in 15 minutes that's a powerful addition that we hope to be able to be offering very soon as kurt and this team finish the beta testing with rosie's support uh, and uh, the engagement of our campus. So that piece is, is not where we stopped either. So that tool allows to improve upon where if you have traditional contact tracing and someone's called after a positive test, their ability to remember who they were in contact with is often 50% of the time they don't remember or know because they simply didn't know those individuals. This app takes care of that. It doesn't need to know as long as you have a phone that is an Android or an, uh, iPhone uh, that uh, has Bluetooth on, and it will soon be available in our, um, hopefully the Apple and uh, Google Play stores. So our final component of that Dr. Watts mentioned uh, was entry testing and Sentinel testing. So we've added this component, which has been a, uh, a level, I would say, of pride that you should have in the institution where we've gone from the ability to do five or 600 tests a day, and this ability to get this population tested as they come back into our camp, the ability to do somewhere between 5,000 and 8,000 tests a day. And that's been done to get those individuals who we know will have some close quarters and who will be back on our college campuses, students, faculty, and staff back in place. And, and the, as Dr. Watts mentioned, the numbers early on, uh, uh, both in both areas, both in the area of the reentry testing is uh, the positivity rates low, as well as we know that in the Sentinel testing, uh, in, in, in all factuality, it's 0.02% in our last week's survey. So, so very low. What, we, what people have asked, particularly related to this campus, we certainly had the, the, the rule for testing all of our students for reentry. Uh, we offered that for our faculty coming back uh, on campus uh, in August because we had the availability of Sentinel testing for the broader community who was already back, but we didn't offer that requirement for all of the 15,000 or so people coming who are already back and we couldn't do that. So that's the simple reason why we didn't make it required. It's our hope is everybody who's coming back in August takes advantage of it and, and gets tested, but not a lax in our planning, but simply reasonable recognition of people who were already back uh, in doing so. What we have found of those people, and uh, and and Sarah Napsinger can comment on it, is that when we've looked at people who've gotten infected while they're back. And let's just take our, our, our medical students, for example, and our other clinical students. They have been a few who've gotten infected. But to the, to the T, that has not a come from a transmission at work. It has come from their community. When we've done the tracing, it has not been that they've been back at UAB. It's been the setting that they've been into their community. That, that, true, that holds true, not in, in, in totality, but the majority of those employees who've gotten infected most likely through our efforts have identified that it's actually a transmission in the community not when they've come to our campus so by all standards we're creating a tremendously safe environment it still will depend on the behavior of all of our participants to do so we will offer regular sentinel testing we want people to take advantage of it it will cut across all people staff students and faculty will have an option to the to the effort that we're trying to do we don't get enough people to volunteer for it when it's offered uh, we offered 1600 slots last week we had 360 take advantage so there's capacity once you are put into that random pool to take advantage uh, to make sure you can participate and we want to make sure people do that so with that i i would final part i would say is that 
this, this whole reentry thing is built on this medical uh, platform that our doctors and our public health officials have put together. It creates a monitoring process for an ongoing evaluation of how we're doing as a community. There's an incident command center uh, led by Katie Crenshaw we will get data with all the relevant leaders on our campus to understand and intervene and inform our leaders, most senior leaders, of what might need to be done if we see changes that put our safety at risk. So we're not going through this blindly by any means. We're going with our eyes wide open. And yet our principle is not that we could ever remove all risk, but to do all we can to mitigate risk. And I think we're doing that. Alicia, uh, I will turn it over to Alicia Jones, our Vice President for Human Resources. All right, thank you, Dr. Vickers. Um, as you all can hear, have already heard, we are doing a lot to maintain a safe environment for those several thousand uh, employees that are already working on site while we're actively preparing for those that will be returning in the fall semester. There are some very specific questions. As I reviewed the questions that were submitted uh, in advance of the town hall, there were some very specific questions about pay and benefits that I can't adequately address in this town hall format, but I will encourage anyone that has a specific question to please contact the appropriate HR office and we'll be glad to uh, uh, answer your question directly. But there were a few questions that I wanted to make certain that I addressed uh, to all of you because one, we saw those questions more than once and uh, we know that these are the kinds of questions we have been hearing in HR. And uh, there was the question about restoring the match for the 403B plan and lifting the hiring suspension. Um, we communicated a timeline in May of where we hope to be able to restore that match and lift the hiring freeze. Uh, there's continued monitoring of the financial situation to make certain that we will be able to continue on that timeline as expected. And right now, I, I don't know the answer to that, but know that it's still being closely monitored and uh, with hopes that we'll be able to continue on the earlier communicated timeline. Um, but while the hiring suspension is in place, recruitment continues for select jobs. So I also want to make certain everyone recognizes that, that just because the hiring suspension is in, is in place, UAB is still hiring and we're still hiring for those jobs that are critically needed. So anyone who's been displaced looking for a new opportunity or even members in our community who want to join the UAB uh, family, we encourage you to apply for those jobs that are open on the UAB career site. Um, there were also questions about the, the merit pool for fiscal 21. Fiscal year 21 begins on October 1st, and there has, um, we have announced that there will not be a merit pool for fiscal year 21, but there has not been any determination for fiscal year 22. So um, that decision is usually made sometime uh, into um, June, July-ish timeframe. So we would expect that that would happen again uh, next year. Um, also, at this point, there are no plans for an early retirement plan. Um, that's something that we, we keep out there, and, and if we need to continue to look into that, know that we will. But right now, there are no plans to offer that. Uh, there were also a few questions about remote work. Um, and I've heard several people talk about how well remote work has, uh, has been and how effective that's worked for them. But on the other hand, I've heard that there have been some challenges that have existed with remote work. And so uh, HR is working to put together resources that can help ease those challenges and provide guidance for leaders. And we hope uh, to share that uh, in hopefully next week, very soon. Um, since we developed the COVID-19 awareness training in May, um, there have been continued improvements in UAB safety strategies. And you heard about some of those even today on this call. And so last week we rolled out an updated training. Our team also developed a short video that highlights what those 
uh, changes have been for those of you who took the training um, uh, after it was first implemented in May. And so that will also be rolling out next week. So I wanna close by saying that you know, during this challenging time, when all of us or many of us are doing so much to take care of others, I wanna remind you not to lose sight of taking care of yourselves. I want to encourage you to look at the virtual wellness tips about exercise, healthy eating, and also learn as much as you can about the many resources that are available through our employee um, assistance and counseling center. All of that you can find on our HR website because we need all of you as we move forward to implement the plans um, that you've already heard about. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Emily Weichel. Thanks, Alicia. Uh, I just wanted to start by saying a big kudos to those of you at home who, or at work who are parents and have navigated this summer with all of the demands of both childcare and uh, busy job schedules. I know that that has been really hard and, we, and we're so grateful to everything y'all are doing. We recognize that moving into fall, changes in some of the school district reopening plans will cause um, even more uh, uncertainty for a lot of, of UAB families. And so I'm really proud that UAB leadership has had uh, a finger on the pulse of this issue since last spring. We uh, have convened a child care task force that has been surfacing some of the challenges and issues um, that UAB's working parents are facing. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the findings through that work and what our proposal is for going forward. Uh, to better understand the scale of the problem and kind of how this issue of, of childcare and, and K-12 district changes was impacting the, the workforce, we conducted a uh, survey at the end of last month to understand the scale of the problem. And we got thousands of responses. So this is obviously something that has been uh, top of mind for a lot of employees. Uh, the real, the real focus of this survey was on the first sort of nine weeks of the school year and how K-12 plans are impacting families. But I do want to acknowledge uh, that we know that the pandemic has also caused shortages in childcare slots for people who have children that are birth to five. And we're working on providing resources around that as well. Um, and I, I'll put a, a link in the chat that goes to some of the, the, the website that has information about that. I just wanna share a couple quick sort of take home points on the survey and then go over our um, options for moving forward. So nearly a thousand of our survey respondents said that due to changes in school district reopening plans, they did not have a childcare or education plan in place to allow them to do their jobs this fall. So obviously this is um, a big issue for a lot of families. When we look at the breakdown of folks on the campus side, there were two main challenges that, that families are facing. The biggest one for campus employees is around access to drop-in care. So the opportunity to have somewhere safe to leave your kid for a couple hours while you do sort of concentrated work on campus, whether that's teaching a class, working in a lab. Um, the secondary thing was that there are a lot of employees who are working full-time on campus and now don't have access to full-time care. And so while that was a more significant issue on the medical side, that, that is um, something we're seeing on campus as well. I also wanted to point out that based on our survey, the three biggest school districts that employees um, are enrolled in are Jefferson County, Hoover, and uh, Birmingham City, all three of which have moved to either all virtual or a hybrid model. So the bottom line is a big portion of our employees are affected by this. And uh, we need to have kind of a menu of options because it looks pretty different for different families. So I'm gonna go through kind of three options that, that we're uh, moving forward with. The first is a drop-in study program for the children of UAB employees. And so hopefully you read about this in the e-reporter this morning, but the goal here is that UAB will provide a safe and supervised environment where your child can come for a couple hours a week um, to complete their remote learning assignments. And so this is gonna be held at the Hilton at UAB. It'll be staffed by uh, UAB students and other um, certified and, and trained individuals. And um, children will have to bring their masks, they'll have to bring a device, um, and they'll, we'll be following all of the 
social distancing and other safety requirements that, that the rest of the campus follows. Uh, there will be a online registration process for this that is not fully set up yet. And so in the meantime, if you're interested in participating in that program, you can uh, pre-register and send us information and we'll put you on the list to get more, more details as that comes out. But this program is um, gonna be held from August 31st until October 30th. And at that point, we'll reassess whether there's a continued need. The second solution I just wanted to point out because uh, this is one that's moving pretty quickly is that uh, UAB has partnered with the McWayne Center. They will be offering um, full-time care slots in an educational environment uh, for employees who are on-site workers and deemed essential. So UAB campus has uh, 27 of those slots that we will be able to offer to our employees. And there are subsidies available, but there's an application process that begins uh, today and closes Wednesday. Uh, so if you are interested in having a full-time care option for your children at the McWayne Center, we'll drop in the chat uh, the link to the application for that. Um, the criteria for that application really focus on financial need of the family and the essential nature of the um, employee's job role. The final thing um, that I wanted to mention that the Child Care Task Force and others on this um, call have been so involved in is just the community response. Obviously, UAB employees are not the only ones who are facing challenges here. And so um, we are maintaining a list of uh, programs that are opening that have availability that you can enroll your children in. Um, and we'll continue to keep that posted throughout the fall. And um, Dr. Vickers is also working with uh, a group of civic leaders who are trying to come up with a more sort of uh, comprehensive community response, because again, this is something that's uh, facing everyone. I do just wanna say though, in closing that uh, UAB, I mean, we are so far ahead of many of the other local employers on this issue. I think it's just one more reason that shows UAB's response uh, to the pandemic has been really phenomenal. So thank you to everyone for, for your engagement on this important issue. Emily, would you give the age ranges for those different options? Sure. So for the drop-in child care center, that will serve children ages kindergarten through eighth grade. The McWayne Center is available for kindergarten through sixth grade. And then the, web, the website that has uh, program offerings is birth to high school. Thanks. Thank you. So now we'll turn to um, pre-submitted questions. Um, there are several questions that are asking about what's behind UAB's decision making for being open or if we had to close. And so I think this relates to the, the Incident Command Center and um, Katie Crenshaw is leading that. So I was wondering if you might say a few words and describe what's happening with that committee. Sure, thank you, Rosie. Uh, I'm Katie Crenshaw. I'm the Chief Risk and Compliance Officer here at UAB. And I'm serving as the chair of the Campus Incident Command Committee. You're right, Rosie, there are a number of factors um, that we are monitoring to evaluate how effective uh, our UAB community can be in the reentry uh, plan that Dr. Vickers and Dr. Watts outlined. Um, of course, we're watching community data and offering that to senior leadership um, so that uh, our, our experts in UAB medicine and public health can help interpret that and, and look at um, you know, modes of instruction and, and phases of return. Um, but more than that, the Incident Command Committee is evaluating how effective we are with this multi-pronged approach for reentry. So we're looking at things like training completion and daily health check completion. Um, we're also looking at uh, incidents where um, there are reports of um, failure to comply or, or failure to follow uh, masking guidelines or distancing guidelines so that we can intervene quickly and make sure that everyone understands the expectations. Uh, earlier this week, uh, we heard uh, in a different town hall from some student government leaders um, who talked a lot about personal responsibility and, and our responsibility as members of this community to hold each other accountable. Um, what this is going to require is forming new daily habits um, and, and really a culture change for how we engage with each other on campus. Um, and if we are, uh, if we Im implement these strategies consistently, we can be um, effective in mitigating the spread of the virus here at UAB. Great, thank you. And just a follow-up question for you and probably Dr. McMahon, people wanna know what 
phase of re-entry we're, we're in. Um, are we pro pro progressing based on date or, or on these color codes? So. I'll start and then maybe Dr. McMahon can chime in. Uh, you know, initially when the reentry plan was launched on the website, there were target dates associated, but uh, it was made clear um, in the context that it would be public health indicators that would be driving uh, those phases of return. So yes, we still are in a modified business operation, um, which means we are, you know, uh, still limiting capacity here on campus and, and all of the strategies that you've heard today um, will minimize, you know, the number of people in different areas and groupings. So, um, you know, I, I encourage people to uh, continue to visit the UAB United website um, around uh, the phases of return um, and keep in touch with their unit leaders to understand what their operational plans are. Um, one thing I will mention, if, if employees have concerns, about what this reentry will look like for them on a daily basis. Um, be in touch with, with supervisors and unit leaders to understand what their specific operational plan includes. Thank you. Dr. McMahon, did you wanna add anything? I actually don't have anything to add, so Katie, Katie gave a great answer. Great. Um, we also had a few questions um, asking about um, just our facility. So um, what we're doing uh, to maintain safety in our facilities. People did ask about if there would be changes in the HVAC. Um, so I'm going to pass that on to Greg Parsons and maybe you can give us an update there. Certainly. Thank you. All of our spaces have fresh outside air. <clears throat> uh, many of our buildings have 100% outside air. Some have 10 to 20% outside air, which results in air changes of four to six air changes in a space per hour. We've maximized the outside air where we can. We've also installed the highest quality filtration available for the units in, on campus. And a big part of what's happened is the reduced occupancy. The typical occupancy in a classroom is about one third of its designed occupancy. In essence, that provides you three times as much air per person as the space was designed for. So we have, we have done what we, the maximum that we can to provide the most outside air, the best filtration. And the last thing I'd like to mention is wearing your mask. Think of your mask as your personal air filter that's with you at all times. It helps protect you and protect others. Great, thank you. Um, related to masks, people wanna know, um, are masks required? We're still getting that question. So uh, I think we've said emphatically yes, but um, they also wanna know a little detail about when they'll get masks. I know that they're delayed, but um, if maybe Dr. McMahon might be the best person to, to respond to the mask question. Yeah, so um, Dr. Benoit mentioned earlier uh, today that the mask distribution would start on, I believe it's August 20th and 21st. So Dr. Benoit, correct me if I'm saying those dates wrong. It's in uh, lot four. And so that's going to be a drive-through distribution. So you can stay in your car and drive through and get your mask. It's really important to remember to have your one card. You cannot get your mask without your one card and you cannot get masks for anyone besides yourself. There's also gonna be distribution spaces uh, outside Lister Hill Library and University Hall and in the bookstore. And those uh, will be open for several days during the first week of the semester. So again, you can walk up to those tables and bring your one card and get your, your masks there. So the dates are the 21st and the 22nd. Thank you for correcting that. Thank you. We had several questions that came in about the app. So I'm hoping that Dr. Carver can speak to privacy, a lot of privacy questions. Um, and also who can use the app? Can your family members use the app? Yeah, so the, we, we've just finished up uh, beta testing with Apple and uh, Google and we're going through the final uh, stages of release. Uh, so I, I would say um, the release to the public is um, mid-August, of, of which it is mid-August, so it's very soon. And uh, privacy permeates every aspect of the app. We've built it in from the ground up. Uh, the app does not track your location, does not track your identity, does not access your contact list. Instead, it's generating a random um, identifier every 10 to 20 minutes and changes that identifier every uh, 10 to 20 minutes and then um, uh, uses a verification system 
with the Alabama Department of Public Health to ensure that if you come into contact, a contact being defined as within six feet for 15 minutes uh, during a 24 hour period, then you're going to, um, after that's verified, you'll be, uh, you'll receive a notification through the app. Everyone in the state of Alabama can notify, can use the app. It'll be posted in the Apple and Google uh, store. Um, the data while it's inside the app is encrypted. The data when it moves across any network is encrypted. Uh, so there is a lot of privacy and security built into the app to ensure that uh, uh, your uh, privacy is protected and your data is confidential. And the direct question on family members, absolutely, uh, they can use the app. In fact, we want them to use the app. It's really highly encouraged. All of you should use the app. Um, be a hero, be a hero. Beat COVID-19, do your part, and uh, download the app when it is released in very short order. We have a big marketing campaign kicking off next Monday for the GuideSafe app. So we want to get everybody in the state to use it. So please help us out and share and encourage others to use it. Um, so turning to testing, several questions about like what um, can a person request an antibody test and uh, what kind of test are we, are we conducting? So Dr. Nafziger. Hey, thanks. I'd be happy to answer that question. So uh, first I'll talk about antibody testing. So uh, we do have antibody testing available, but quite frankly, uh, it has limited utility at this point because the science is unclear about what we do with the result from an antibody test, whether it be positive or negative. So right now at this time, Employee Health does not routinely offer antibody testing for our employees because we frankly just don't really know what the results mean as far as work restrictions or your future risk of catching COVID-19. So uh, that's the piece about antibody testing. Um, now our testing platform that we utilize for employees who are symptomatic um, is a PCR-based testing platform. It's the same one that we use for our patients in the hospital or uh, our community members um, at, our, at our community test site. So that is a PCR-based testing platform. Um, and I'll stop there, thanks. And just to follow up um, it, with, on testing, uh, somebody submitted, is it possible for employees eligible for Sentinel testing but who haven't been invited to do so to volunteer to be tested? It sounds like there's available slots that are underutilized. So Dr. Vickers or Dr. Knapsecker? Uh, it, someone, you're muted. Two parts of that, if you're on campus, uh, we try, we're trying to honor the randomization process. Um, and it's probably easiest to wait till you get your randomization to get tested. Um, but I, I, if, if someone would email me, I'll ask Dr. Agarwal if we have a mechanism for those who were not randomized into the sample to go in and volunteer. Okay. I, I, I mentioned one other thing, Rosie, and just to the note, and Sarah can verify this, all of this testing really has been driven by, as Ray mentioned, collaborative partnership. Our, our, path, our pathology lab with Dr. Neto and the hospital and Dr. Alil and Dr. Vanderpool in the microbiology lab have given us really phenomenal service and capacity. And so when you do get tested, it's typically a 24 hour turnaround and sometimes the same day depending when it's put on the run. Absolutely. Um, I could add a little more detail to that. Um, we've had a lot of employees asking about when I report a symptom, you know, what's the turnaround time to get a test done. And so when you report your symptoms using health check, uh, we have a call center that will call you to schedule your testing typically within 24 hours. And then the day that you get tested, we get the results back usually in the late evening uh, or overnight of that same day. So you get a call the next day with test results. We do prefer strongly for employees who, who uh, need to test, we prefer for them to go through us because we can get the results back so much quicker than uh, we've seen with some of our other sites uh, off campus. So we do appreciate that rapid turnaround from our pathology department. Uh, they've just been absolutely heroic in this pandemic in the pulling, pulling together this testing strategy for us. And I would add that the tests that our pathology department does are the most reliable and most sensitive down to fractions of DNA or RNA. So it's very accurate 
and they've done a terrific job. If we didn't have them, we wouldn't have the testing that we had. Other places have had to depend on vendors and somebody else supplying test kits and so forth. We saw early on that that wasn't going to be very reliable. So our uh, physician scientists did it themselves and did it as well as it can be done. A lot of people are asking about um, health check daily. And since you helped make that decision uh, this morning, Dr. Watts, maybe you could let folks know what we expect with health check. When health check was set up initially, it was an every three day reminder because that was felt to be often enough to be able to really track the virus and not be too far away. But as we've worked through it operationally, and as we have in some of our clinical students and others have gone to a daily use, it's very easy to use. It's simply answering a question, do you feel well today or do you not feel well today? If you feel well today and you cleared in the past, then you hit the button and you get that green passport on your smartphone. And that means you're fine to go wherever you need to be that day. If you're not well, it'll be red and you can't go. And it'll give you instructions of what to do. There's a whole algorithm within that that will give you step-by-step -step instructions of what to do. And for students, student health, for employees, employee health. So, uh, Using it daily also is like getting up in the morning and you have breakfast and brush your teeth and getting ready to head out the door to work or to school. You just answer that question. You do that health check that morning and you've got your passport for the day. And that way, every three days is an odd time. And if for some reason you didn't get notified or something, you might not even think about it every three days. But if you do this every day before you walk out of the house or as soon as you pick your smartphone up in the morning, then you can, or go on your computer, log in and do it. And you've got your passport, you're ready for the day and you won't forget. And so we're going to this daily approach and also give us really daily information about every employee and every student. We will know who's feeling well and who's not feeling well that day. And our instant command committee will follow and track those data on this dashboard. And so we'll know where we need to intervene or where there might be an issue. Great, thank you. So this is, this is what it looks like when you're cleared. There you go. Very easy. Um, someone wants to know if UAB is following concerns of injustice uh, at UAB voiced on social media. So, Dr. Dilworth. And yes, thank you, Rosie. Um, yes, actually, um, we sent a communications to the site administrators, um, providing them with some information in terms of ways that students or anyone who has a concern could reach out to us anonymously. Also, the Office of Compliance has a hotline that uh, similar complaints can be reported to. And I would encourage anyone who has a concern to use that as a opportunity as well. And as a follow-up question, someone asked, um, is there complicit bias or diversity training offered to UAB staff? Yes, um, we have five modules um, that are offered to staff. You could actually uh, visit our website at uab.edu backslash DEI and click on the link for diversity education. That's the spot there where you can see the schedule of courses as well as um, all of the modules that are offered. Thank you. And I'll put the link in, I'll put the link in the chat. Thank you. Um, there's been a few questions that were pre-submitted and I see some coming in um, just about concern and questions about another furlough. Um, I know it's hard to kind of look into the future and predict, um, but people are asking, do you think there will be another furlough? Um, can those who were just brought back, are they, can they potentially lose their jobs? Um, Alicia or... Let sure. me address that. Okay. I'll address that first. Right. Um, no, we're not planning on any additional furloughs and overall our clinical enterprise as we have gotten more and more busy in these last few months has returned to its financial health it's not perfect we still 
cost a lot to deal with COVID and there were reduced revenue streams, but it is stabilizing. Our research enterprise is actually ahead of last year in funding. And so uh, we right now are about 7% ahead of last year. And last year we were 10% ahead of the previous year. So everybody's been working hard our faculty and our employees and our students and graduate students. So as we brought more back to the labs and back to campus, we are socially distancing, we are following the safety measures, and we are sometimes having some work in the morning and some work in the afternoon in the labs. But So the research enterprise is healthy. And now as we come back to campus, right now, you know, for the summer term, for example, we were concerned that we were going to be down in both uh, enrollment and in credit hour production. And the fact of the matter is we actually were up a little bit compared to the year before. Coming into the fall semester, we are anticipating perhaps being down 2%, something like that. That's a lot less than earlier when we thought it could be 5 or 6 or 7%. And the closer we get, and the more everybody sees the comprehensive nature of this plan, the more people are making a decision, yes, I'm going to enroll this fall. But we've allowed a lot of flexibility so that people can make well-informed decisions. But we anticipate, therefore, that uh, our tuition revenue will be somewhere close to what it was last year, maybe down a little bit. Good thing from the standpoint of our state budget, it is stable. We did not have proration, we'll not have that in FY20. And for FY21, our budget's gonna be slightly up, two or 3% perhaps. Now there are increased costs in dealing with COVID and that will reduce some of that, but it's stable. The bottom line is we are anticipating financial stability going forward. Now. If there was something unexpected that occurred and something really happened strangely with the epidemic and things got out of hand, then obviously we've got contingency plans for every scenario, but we intend to be successful. And if all of our employees, students work together, we can do this safely. And we expect that to be the course. So, um, we are excited about the future. This virus is not going to be away soon. We're going to have to learn how to manage it and manage ourselves in order to keep fulfilling our mission and doing our work. Thank you, Dr. Watts. Um, an individual wants to know, how are campus events going to be organized um, for students and staff? So I know we put some guidelines around that. Maybe Dr. McMahon might be the best person to speak to that about the 10. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to uh, send that question to Dr. John Jones at right. the student organization. And they're asking for just uh, employees as well. So I think Dr. Jones. Sure. Thank you, Rosie. John Jones, Vice President of Student Affairs. Um, we are in the process of communicating with our registered student organizations regarding programming um, here on campus. And certainly, if students fulfill those guidelines, there are certain criteria that they have to meet. If they meet those criteria, um, they can have programs and, and events here on campus. And certainly, we have designated space. And part of designating the space, um, certainly, our students have to um, wear a mask, um, stay at least six feet apart while we're in that space, as well as um, um, having a capacity in terms of the number of individuals that are in that space as well. So currently we're looking at um, indoor space, no more than 10 individuals and outdoor space, no longer, no more than 20 individuals. Although we have received some information from the system and we're in the process of integrating that information um, from the system office to be in compliance. Uh, but nonetheless, um, we are communicating constantly to our students to help them understand what the requirements are. And Dr. Jones, as a follow-up, people want to know about what are the student eating locations? An individual says, what are, you know, where are students going to eat? Um, sure. Um, okay. Great question as well. Um, the same eating locations that we've had previously um, within the Hill Student Center, our intentions um, are to bring those 
three um, venues up, um, Mean Bowl, um, Panera, Bread, Panera Bread, as well as Full Moon. Uh, we they will open up in transition, uh, meaning there will be one. Then a few days later, we'll open up the second one and send if we can ensure that um, students are maintaining that separation, then we will open up the third. Again, we will be reviewing and observing um, the behavior of individuals frequenting, frequenting those spaces to ensure that um, um, they meet the health requirements that are expected um, of all patrons. So with that said, in, in addition to that, the other places that will be open are, are certainly are a common dining operation will be open as well. Um, places that will be closed is uh, WOW, um, World of Wings, um, Starbuck, uh, um, Stern Library, and they're closed down primarily for renovation. Um, um, the other operations that will be closed are the food uh, venues within the Collette School of Business. But beyond that, our anticipation is that all other food operations will be open. Um, primarily when they are open, uh, there will be no inside dining. It'd be primarily ordering online or grab and go type of operation. Thank you. And I can just add a few uh, more comments to that. We are asking that students do not eat in the classroom during lectures. So students will have uh, space to uh, listen to, to their uh, taped lectures, study and eat lunch in Bartow Arena and also in the School of Education. So those spaces are going to be used as overflow spaces or space for students in between classes. And then of course, outside space is a great space for students uh, and staff and faculty for that matter to have lunch. And uh, about uh, events on our campus, we are asking that all seminars and those kinds of events that are academic be online or continue to be virtual as they have been done uh, towards the end of the spring and all through the summer. Thank you. Well, we are running out of time, so I just wanna hand it off to Dr. Benoit for some closing uh, remarks and Dr. Dr. Watts. Uh, let me just say again that we're so proud of all the efforts that you've done to this point. And as Emily mentioned earlier, we know it hasn't been easy with childcare issues, sometimes other issues with families while well, we've tried to balance that as well as the pandemic. But the thing that I am most impressed about is that UAB has real, everybody is really working very hard to have a successful semester. And I, I will tell you, if I was going to be any place during this kind of a situation, it would be at UAB. I'm so proud to be here with everybody working so hard and being able to use the incredible expertise that we have on this campus to develop this kind of a sophisticated plan. Well, I echo that, Dr. Benoit, and can't tell you how proud we are of each and every one of you and the great jobs that everyone is doing and dealing with these challenging times. I'm like Dr. Benoit, there's no place I'd rather be than at UAB. And I'm proud of all of our faculty and staff and our students, proud of our resilience, proud of how we serve our community, even in the midst of the worst pandemic we've ever seen in our lifetime. So. UAB is doing so much for the people of Alabama and beyond. The research that we're doing will have an impact that's felt around the world. So thank you for all you're doing. We hope you can recognize how serious we are about being as thoughtful going forward as possible. So have a good day and hope you have a good weekend. Thank Goodbye. you. Goodbye.